<laughs> so we don't want to exercise the old franchise then? The what? Franchise. The sacred right of the Englishman to cast his vote for the candidate of his choice. All right. I wonder why you bother. In a democracy, it is every man's right, nay, his duty, to vote. With 28 million votes, who's going to notice yours? The whole system depends on people like me, who first weigh the issues and then make a responsible decision. I don't believe you even know what issues are. Go on, what are they? Go on, tell me. Name me one issue. Go on, name me one issue. Go on, go on. Go on, name me an issue. Go on. Go on. No! Go on. No, I don't feel like it. You haven't been watching, have you? Every time I switch on Gallery or This Week or Pamirana, eager for another duel with Robin Day's eye slits, what do you do? Spread out your nails to dry or sit round spitting in your eye shadow? <laughs> and to think your vote cancelled out mine last time. Anyway, I've made up my mind. Oh. Oh, who have you decided to favour with your suffrage, then? I'm not saying. Come on. No, oh. it, it's a secret. You're not supposed to ask. Oh, I give up. The ballot is secret, but the Representation of the People Act does not prohibit a husband asking his wife's intentions within the confine of the conjugal home. Oh. Yes. <laughs> All right, then. If you must know, I fancy that Mr Grimmond. <laughs> the Liberals? Yeah, that one with the floppy hair. <laughs> what do you know about liberalism, liberalism eh? <laughs> you wouldn't recognise a graduated industrial co-partnership scheme if it bit you in the leg. I never said I would. I just said I fancy Mr Grimmond. What do you mean, you fancy him? <laughs> well, I just fancy him. Why? Well, I like the way he wrinkles his nose. <laughs> Give me strength. You can't vote for a man because of the way he wrinkles his nose. It's policies and ideals and experience you pick him for. Well, I didn't pick you because you worked on the bacon counter at Sainsbury's. <laughs> Why did you pick me, then? Because I fancied you. <laughs> at the time. <laughs> Well, now you're choosing a Prime Minister, not a husband. Noses have got nothing to do with it. Why don't you vote for Harold Wilson? His head's too big for his body. <laughs> it reminds me of the frog. Oh, stop now, crow. What about the other one, then? Home. Oh, I couldn't fancy him. Oh, no, his upper lip reminds me of a rabbit. Oh. <laughs> I see, I see, I see. <laughs> That's the way our future's going to be decided, is it? Never mind the independent deterrent, never mind free enterprise or state control, never mind the balance of payments or housing or pensions or, or the 11 plus. With you, it's just drop your drawers and vote for Joe. <laughs> All right, then. Who are you going to vote for? Labour, as usual. When it comes to the boat race, I'm Cambridge. When it comes to election, I'm Labour, like Dad was before me. Anyway, I could never vote for Grimmond, whatever his policy was. Why not? I can't stand the way he wrinkles his nose. <laughs> crisis in our island history, the hour has produced a great man to rally the people with a stirring call to action. At Agincourt, it was... God for heaven, England and St. George! At Trafalgar, it was... England expects this day that every man will do his duty. At Waterloo, it was... <laughs> At Dunkirk, it was. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight in the streets. We shall never surrender. And in 1963's dark days of economic crisis, it was. 
All I'm asking for, on the part of everyone in the country, is an infinitesimal extra effort. <laughs> for the music. When it stops, Militant Martin will be here to speak to you. Good afternoon. Today we're going to sing about how we choose our leader. Diddle, old Mac on the fiddle, MacLeod jumped over the moon. The little hog laughed to see such fun, and Britain got landed with Hume. There. Wasn't that a jolly way to choose a leader? But not everybody enjoyed it, did they? By our A.B. Butler, no one could be subtler. But you won't find a number ten that has our A.B. Butler in. By our A.B. Butler. And now it's time for our story. Are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. Once upon a time there were three little boys called Alec, Harold and Joe. And they each wanted to have a party. Only a few people came to Joe's party and they only came because they were his relations. <laughs> so they all played forfeits and all went home without their deposits. <laughs> Harold had a much bigger party because he had promised to do his conjuring tricks. He turned nationalization into cozy state enterprise before their very eyes. And his popular tricks were called sawing the profits in half and the vanishing deterrent. <laughs> As an encore, he showed them how he could balance on an issue facing both ways at once. <laughs> Alex's party was crowded with nice mannered society children because he had said there would be CBEs and knighthoods and baronesses for tea and a huge national cake of which his party would get the biggest pieces. And they played Follow My Leader, Hog in the Middle, and a very rough version of the Eaton Wall game called Crutch, in which Rab the dog got rather badly hurt. But Mother was disgusted with their party manners and said they were all rude little boys and would have to go to the country. And when they went to the country, they found they weren't sitting comfortably at all. They were sitting marginally. And they were all dropped down to the bottom of a big pole and everyone lived happily ever after without them. <laughs> there. Wouldn't you like that to happen here? And now we'll sing a little rhyme that the children enjoyed so much at Alex's party. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Catch a Commonwealth immigrant by his toe. If he's Irish, let him in. You can tell he's Irish by his skin. <laughs> and now, I must tell you about tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. They'll be just like today, only worse and worse and worse. <laughs> Sir, allow me to introduce myself. Well, sir, I, I can't stop now. I just be off down post office. You know who I am, of course. I've uh, been your MP for ten years, and I'm counting on you to vote for me again this time. Ah, uh, well, I can't buy no more than five minutes. See, I, I get down post office. Now, now, tell me, sir, are, are you uh, are you happy about everything? Uh, uh, oh, ah, 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 ah. Ah, now you're asking, aren't you? I mean, you want to go and ask them poor beggars down yonder over there, uh, turned out in the twilight of their lives. What exactly is the trouble? 
splats, I call them. All the people's splats. I know what I call them. Bloody rabbitouches, I call them. <laughs> what they done deserve that in the twilight of their lives. It's them beggars on the council, it is. You can't live here, they says. You can't leave in them conditions what they lived in like man and boy. And now they're in the toilet of their lives, they put them in them bloody rabbit hutches. That but I, the I'm sure now. they must have amenities that they're very glad of. Probably didn't have electricity before, did they? No, and that they don't want it now. No, not now in the toilet of their lives. Don't want that, no. Oil lamps is what they've always had, see, and they don't want what they are sitting about in that there blinding light just because them council beggars don't want them sitting about in the dark. <laughs> no, they like sitting in the dark. That's how they've always sat, in the dark. Ah, uh, you know, we are in the dark. Shouldn't yes, but you... <laughs> <laughs> but you I... must agree, sir, that I... our rehousing scheme... Ah. Are, they're doing a very first-class job in clearing the rural slums and putting people into sanitary conditions. Ah, that's just what I'm on about, you see. This sanitary... Uh, what, uh, what's his name there? Ah, uh, what's wrong with the good old earth closets? Ah. <laughs> so I told him, I said, it's all very well for you sitting there, I said. But all the time... <laughs> ah, yes, yes. <laughs> ah. It's all very well, I said, but all the time you're pulling that chain there, it's costing you money. Yeah, yeah, it all that comes off your bit of pension, I said, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm very glad you've told me about all this, but now I have... I told old Fred Armitage, I said, that water don't go rushing down like that without somebody fetches it up in the first place, I said. Ah, yes, he said that. Yes, it's all very well, but look, I really... Oh, oh, I'll, I'll think it over, I'll... I'll think it over, but you think thinking it over too, see? You want to look into them closets. You'll be sitting there one day in the toilet of your life, rattling a chain, the blinding light of your pension going down the drain. <laughs> Mrs. Wilson herself has admitted that if her husband has a fault, it's a tendency to smother everything in HP sauce. Now ask yourselves, is this the kind of man we want to have kissing the hand of our queen? <laughs> Mr. Grimmond, my name is Weisenheimer, and I'd like to ask you one question. What kind of party are the Liberals? Uh, the Liberals, Mr. Weisenheimer, are the young, radical, forward-looking party of a young, forward, radical-looking progressive. I oh, couldn't have put it better, Mr. Grimmond. In short, with it. Mm. Now, what goes with elastic sides, a turn-up on the bypass, backcombing and an all-night beat session? A Liberal vote. <laughs> now, you and I can do business, Mr. Grimmond. You and I can do business. What exactly is your business, Mr. Wise? No, I bought him with me, Mr. Grimmond. I bought him with me. Britain's number one recording star, Zero Zombie. One of my boys. Now, come in here, Zombie. Zombie. Come on, come on. Take your thumb out your mouth and smile at Mr. Grimmond. Here he is, Mr. Grimmond. The answer to your problem. What problem? You need support in Parliament, right? Here it is. Here it is. I won't beat about the bush. Zero is offering to stand as a Liberal candidate. Oh, indeed. Uh, what are your political views, Mr. Zombie? Uh, well, uh, you know, like, uh, more for the teenagers and that, like, you know, I mean, I mean, don't forget the old people and that, you know, I mean, take the text off the pop records and I'm all for this multiliterate disarmament of the nignogs and that, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he doesn't always express himself too clearly, Mr. Grimmond, <laughs> but he feels it, you know, he feels it, he feels well, it. Well, I'm afraid, down. Mr. Weisenheimer, that to make its present felt, my party needs rather more than one zombie. Ah, oh, that's exactly what you need, Mr. Grimmond. I've got 200 more boys under contract, just like this one. And uh, now I'm offering you the lot in the package deal. Now, just think of it, 200 votes for you delivered on the nail in the division lobby. 200 free plugs for you and the usual 10%. Now, what can we lose? Our deposits, Mr Weisenheimer, our deposits. <laughs> You've overlooked one point, getting them elected in the first place. Now, do me a favour, please. A politician like Mr Heath, he holds a public meeting and six people turn up, right? Zero does a one-night stand and we draw 5,000, easy. That's for pop singing, not to hear a political policy. Ah, well, I'm ahead of you, Mr. Grimmond. Meet the necrophiles. Here they are, the necrophiles. Finest group in the country. Now, just listen to this. We're calling it Ad Lib for Joe. All set, boys? Get your throat mic plugged in zero? Yeah. All right. Give them the beats. A one, a two, a one, two, three. I'm so comprehensive schools. No partnership. No British bomb. Bye. Long I lay away. Sleep is not for me. Social justice. Could make a big mistake. Just you wait and see. Transferable pension scheme. Think I can't go on living. Life's a misery. Unless you vote for Joe. Bless you. Vote for Joe. Lest you vote for Joe. And for me. Bye. 
I pay capital gains tax. I'm counting on you for so who who Mark your X for me. 100% mortgages. Cash your X certificate. That I long to see. And take me. Stake me. Make me. Your MP. A great number, boys, a great number. Uplift and a nice touch of sentiment. You get the idea, Mr Grimman? You make the policy, we get in the top ten. A few more like that and you'll be laughing all the way to Downing Street with 200 MPs behind you. Is it a deal? Well, it's a tempting offer, Mr Weisenheimer, but I'm afraid not. A bit too much of a gimmick, if you know what I mean. <sighs> That's a trouble with the Liberals. No air for music. All right, boys, straight round the transport house. <laughs> Uh, they told me I'd better come down here to get this policy statement processed or something before the broadcast. Yes, you? yes, right here, Minister. Now, I've uh, got your text there, have you? Good. Yes. Uh, let's just uh, take a decker before we feed it into the computer. Uh, I don't quite understand. Well, what's this um, computer business? Well, now, policy statements are tricky things. We don't want to get carried away too far, do we? For instance, what have you got down there, you see? We must build more houses. Oh, oh, oh. no, no, it's a bit bald, isn't it? I mean... A switch on your random statistic interpolator, Fred. Uh, wait, oh, yeah, right. We must build more houses. And may I remind you that under the Tory housing drive, over two and a half million homes of no fixed bars. I say, I say, look here, I mean, that can't be right, can't oh, be dear, right. Dear, 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 dear. Uh, Fred, Fred, your interpolator. Hey, what? Uh, your interpolator, oh. you've still got it tuned to Labour. I'm sorry oh, about that, Minister. <laughs> We were up all night with a rush job for Transport House and we haven't had time to switch all the terminals over. Yeah, 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 you, you mean to say your computer is equally capable of putting out propaganda for our opponents? Mm, that's the beauty of the machine. Okay. I mean, it's got full built-in party variability. Uh, of course, the output is much the same on all settings. It takes a trained ear to spot a little mistake like that. <laughs> Naturally, we have statistics to support any policy. Remarkable, quite remarkable. Now, uh, what was it you were wanting to say? Well, well, I just jotted down a few things here, just general headings, you know, of, like, social justice. Burden of taxation. Indeed, yes, the grievous burden of taxation. Home policy setting at normal, Fred. Now, what about foreign? Uh, we must stand firm with our allies. Quite, not forgetting the Commonwealth of the United States and Western Europe, naturally. Uh, standard three-way comprehensive circuit, Fred. Optimism full on. <laughs> Cliché output, rich. <laughs> Fire in the belly button, pre-selected to feed in during peroration, right? Right. Uh, look, look, look here, look here. Uh, well, what am I supposed to do during this? Just say your piece into the intake here, right. and when you hear the machine hum, pause for it to interpolate, and we'll have the whole job on tape for you in two shakes. Ready, Fred? Right. Uh, no, gee, it's getting a bit warm. I'm worried about the feedback. It'll hold all right, don't worry. Right, Minister, off you go. Right. We are determined to build at home a society founded on social justice. Without sacrificing the sacred right of individual enterprise. Right, back to you. Right. We are determined to defend our currency. Without creating mass unemployment. And to lighten further the grievous burden of taxation. Without destroying our social services. While abroad, we must stand firm with our allies, never forgetting the ties. The ties that bind us to our friends. And I've got that down here. In the Commonwealth. In the Commonwealth and West of Europe. Western Europe and the free world. And in the free world. Don't forget in the Commonwealth. Oh, Sounds like a condenser flow, Fred. Oh, it's no good. She's overeating now. Fred, Fred, your feet's jamming. Your feet's jamming, Fred. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Fred, it's gibbering. Pull the wires out, Fred. Pull these wires out, Fred. Yes, pull these wires out. So you're an MP. <laughs> How fascinating. I've always been fascinated by the House of Commons. Tell me all about it. No, oh, we lead narrow lives, you know, at Westminster. Actually, till I met you, I had no idea how fascinating constituents could be. <laughs> Especially constituents like uh, yours. <laughs> oh, and you all sit in rows, don't you? Which row do you sit in? Well, my ambition was always to be on the front bench. 
till I gave her this lift in my car. <laughs> now, here we are on the back bench, and <laughs> it's much crazier. Uh... <laughs> and when you're sitting there, what happens next? Well, now you mention it, <laughs> we generally move on to the next motion. <laughs> really? What sort of motions do you like best? <laughs> Well, yes, sometimes we go into a committee to consider ways and means. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And we pursue matters through the usual channel. I see. <laughs> and we sometimes press things to a division. Really? <laughs> it sometimes turns into an all-night session, you know. Who, oh, poor thing? to stick it out all night. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. Especially if they put the whips on. <laughs> They never let you off the whips. <laughs> Unless, of course, you've already paired off with another MP. You don't mean... No, 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 of course, you only pair... <laughs> no, you only pair with a member of the opposite party. Uh, yes, I'm relieved to hear that. Mm, it's a funny game, politics. <laughs> oh, is that what you call it? What are you doing? Yeah, I was just moving on to the next motion. <laughs> Cut that out! Oh. Where, um, where are you going? I'm suspending the sitting. You can't recommend a dissolution now when everything is going so well. Oh, no, can't I? <sighs> Funny game, politics. <laughs> How do you choose a political party? We tested the three main brands on the market, and to enable our members to make a rational choice, we applied two main questions. First, what do they do for you? Our laboratory analysis showed that... The Labour Party ran the country for six years from 1945. They spent £4,000 million a year and achieved three economic crises, the loss of India, and the nationalisation of every bankrupt industry down to our canals. <laughs> The Tory party ran the country for over 12 years, from 1951. They spent £7,000 million a year and achieved twice as many crises, the losses of Africa and the nationalisation of the Suez Canal. The Liberals last ran the country for nine years, from 1906, resulting in the Great War and the loss of Ireland. <laughs> They spent only £200 million a year, but you got value for money in those days. <laughs> we were unimpressed by any party's claim to be fit to run the country and passed on to the next question. What sort of people do you have to mix with? In the case of the Liberals, the question is largely hypothetical. Unless you happen to live in Orpington, you are unlikely to meet another Liberal. <laughs> <laughs> The Tories, who numbered 13,750,000 at the last count, are, on the other hand, instantly recognisable. They consist of all those who dislike paying income tax, notably... Landlords, bishops, property speculators, peers... Shopkeepers, publicans, brewers and distillers, pimps, public hangmen, bankers and other usurers. Bookmakers, <laughs> bookmakers, both on the course and on the stock exchange, and all those who are photographed in the Tatler enjoying a joke at Hunt Balls. The Tory party can be roughly divided into two sections, men and women. Uh, there is a rule of thumb guide to distinguish between the two groups. The ones wearing hats with veiled flowers, fruits or ostrich feathers are nearly always women. A third element in the party is the young Conservatives. And here it is impossible to separate the sexes except with a bucket of water. <laughs> Conservative principles were all laid down by Disraeli and no Tory has ever been able to improve on them. They are... To maintain our institutions. From the Church of England, capital punishment, the House of Lords, blood sports, London season, flagellation. To uphold the empire. But don't let the nignogs come here to live. <laughs> to elevate the conditions of the people. 
Uh, meaning the top people by means of untaxed capital gains. These principles still appeal to the keenest and contemporary Tory intellects. Ranging from Ted Dexter to Lord Montgomery by way of Jimmy Edwards. <laughs> you can't really blame the top Tories for the way they behave. Look into their background and what do you find? Practically every one was sent to an approved school. Eton and Trinity. Harrow and Jesus. <laughs> Rugby and Christ knows. <laughs> Roughly every 15 years, the British electorate gets so heartily sick of government by Etonians that they say, let's give the other lot a go. They can't be as bad as this. The other lot are the Labour Party, and they quickly prove that they can. <laughs> Whereas the Tories want to pay less tax, the Socialists want to see heavier taxes for other people. Their thinking is definitely more up-to-date than the Tories, which dates back to 1870. Labour principles were laid down by Keir Hardy as recently as 1900. The party is extremely proud of its working-class origins. In the general strike, many of its leaders showed solidarity with the strikers by cutting their lectures at Oxford. At the time of the Great Depression and the hunger marches, many of today's foremost socialists published some extremely militant books on economic theory, explaining how it all happened, which gained them several university fellowships. The chief difference between them and the Tories is the way they choose their leader. While the Tories choose to serve under the man they disliked least, the Socialists selected the man they disliked most. <laughs> At the last count, there were 12,216,000 Labour voters, and the party divides itself naturally into two parts. First, the intellectuals, who can both read and write the new statesmen and all live in working-class Hampstead, so that they may have the benefit of being represented in Parliament by Mr Henry Brook. <laughs> Second, the trade union element. Young Tories who go into industry dream of rising by hard work from office boy to chairman with 6,000 a year and a knighthood. Young socialists dream of rising by stoppages of work from shop steward to union general secretary and ultimately chairman of nationalised industry with 10,000 a year and a peerage, me oh lovely. <laughs> Conclusions? We cannot conscientiously recommend any brand of party on the market. Several were found to be electorally unsafe, and failed to conform to British standards, but deplorable as those are. But since the only alternative are Scottish or Welsh nationalism... Come around the earth, my old buddy. <laughs> oh, up your kilt. <laughs> or communism. Up on the bus to Cuba. <laughs> suggest applying this test to see which of the three major parties is likely to suit you best. How do you react to the statement, the Tories own 88% of the wealth in the country? Uh, let's keep it that way. You are a Tory. Let's get it off them. And you're a socialist. Well, come on. Surely there must be a liberal around somewhere. I'm a liberal. Let's give it all to Oxfam. <laughs> Come to order, please, oh, no, no, brothers. No, 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 no. Uh, I declare this ad hoc subcommittee duly convened. Are all the delegates here? Oh, oh, yes, oh yes, yes, Good, good. Are our brothers from the Musicians Union? Musicians Union. Musicians Union here. Oh, yeah. uh, and you. Our terms of reference are to consider amendments to the party's campaign song, The Red Flag, and report back our findings, if any. Now, I'd like to move uh, from the chair that the song be sung, perhaps for the last time, in the usual manner. Uh, will you be kindly upstanding, brothers? Uh, one, two. The people's flag is deep as red It's shrouded of our martyr dead And ere their limbs grew stiff and cold Their hearts blood died is every foe then raise the star and stand alive Within its shade we'll live or die Though cowards lynch and traitors sneer We'll keep the red flag flying here Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, yes, thank you. Let's the song as at present constituted. Uh, any suggestions for improvements? Uh, yeah, brother chair, yeah. I'll move the deletion of the word shrouded in verse 1, subsection 2. Oh, I second, with a further amendment, deleting the phrase martyred dead. And what about limbs grew stiff and cold in verse 1, subsection 3? 
Do we want to give the impression the Labour Party is harping on imminent death, then? It's all too far funereal. Too Vote near. Labour, you've had your chips. Now, let's begin with the title, The Red Flag. Now, what are the associations of red? Bulls, roadworks, brothels and communism. <laughs> Hardly a vote-winning combination, I think you'll agree. We'll have to change the shade for a start. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Uh, the people's flag is dark magenta. It waves aloft, just left of centre. <laughs> It was just a thought, you know. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, brothers, I think our trouble is not so much the words, which are sacred to organised labour, but the tune. I mean, it, it needs jollying up a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, well, 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 what we want is something traditionally English. Yeah, something patriotic. Oh, wait, 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 I've got another... Well, I've got yeah, one yeah, come uh, on. Uh, our flag of deep is red, wrapped up our martyr dead, till they grew stiff. And co- oh, oh, but... <laughs> no. No. No, Herbert, no. No, no. I know you mean well, but it just might lead to confusion. <laughs> I suggest we have a short adjournment uh, to wet our whistles. Yeah, yeah. All right? Yeah, yeah, we've got an idea. Good. Yes. Uh, well, just a minute, just a minute, just what? a minute. Uh, something to this all English, right? The people's flag is deep, it's red, it's shrouded off the martyr death. And there the limb, 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 limbs grew stiff and cold when the boot on the boot on the boot. Oh. No, 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 Herbert, no. no. Well, it's patriotic, isn't it? We'd have the anti blood sports people down and it's like a ton of bricks. <laughs> Back here in five minutes, right? Who's going to buy the first round? First round? Oh, 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 yeah. My dear Prime Minister, it is with deep regret that I have to tell you that I feel the time has now come for me to lay down the burden of office. It has been my honour and privilege to serve under your inspiring leadership for more than 50 years, and I can say with pride that I have never wavered in my support for you on both sides of all the great issues of our times, in peace and in both wars, that of 1914, no less than that of 1900. <laughs> Through good times and bad, we have marched and slept side by side on the back benches, <laughs> on the front benches, and across the cabinet table. <laughs> Seldom, I can truly say, as a team of ministers been in quite so literal sense one big happy family. <laughs> Nevertheless, as you reminded me on Monday with your gift for classical quotation, tempora omnes mutantur et nos mutantur et innis, as Cicero so wisely observed, and we must recognise that the time may well have come to make way for an older man. <laughs> may I assure you for the future that you will always depend on my unthinking support. My dear Goofy, thank you very, very much for your letter. You know how deeply you regret my decision. You have been a most loyal colleague, and it is a great sorrow to me to feel that I shall no longer have you to lean on in the course of our deliberations. Throughout your long career of inconspicuous public service, you have never spared yourself or the country, approaching all your tasks with an open, indeed, blank mind. <laughs> you will long be remembered as a robust Minister of Health, an immobile Minister of Transport, and an inedible uh, Minister of Food. <laughs> you will show that ignorance is no handicap at the Ministry of Education, and at the Ministry of Labour you demonstrated that indolence is no crime. To the Ministry of Pensions, you brought that invaluable qualification, age. And you have always worked untiringly for our relations with the Commonwealth, by finding untiring work in the Commonwealth for our relations. <laughs> Finally, as a whip, you cracked. <laughs> this is perhaps an unparalleled record, and your services to the party have been second only to mine. I know I speak for the country when I say that your departure from the public scene will come as a well-earned relief. <laughs> you have a lovely home here, Mr. Wilson. I believe this is a favourite area for Labour politicians. Yes, that's right. I don't know what it is about Hampstead, 
but it's quite true that those closest to me in the party have also chosen to be my closest neighbours. On this side, Patrick Gordon Walker and Douglas Jay. Just over the way, you get Dennis Healy and Fred Willey. Round the back, there is Frank Soskis's house, and a bit further on, you find John Freeman and Anthony Greenwood. They all live literally within a stone's throw. For 43 years now, I've been selling carcinogens. Not wittingly, mind you, not wittingly at all, for all that time anyway. But when I first took this kiosk, there wasn't any harm in tobacco. You see, people smoked and died, nobody kept on at them about it. So, I didn't worry unduly when the first scare started, just after the war. There's always somebody trying to spoil other people's pleasures. Didn't somebody put the wind up the Romans by telling them that there was a limit to the number of times when men and women could... Uh, could uh, well, that there was a limit anyway, and... Uh, <laughs> And if they went over that ration, ooh, uh, oh, uh, that belief proved to be ill-founded, as many are no doubt aware. Anyway, no, I reckoned it would be the same story with fags. Then the General Medical Council looked into it and said there wasn't any doubt about it, whatever. And the government accepted their report. Well, anyway, I was worried for a time. I mean, not for myself, mind you, I don't smoke, but I felt, I felt sorry for all those rats and mice. Anyway, besides, the kiosk, the kiosk is my living. But as it turned out, I needn't have worried at all. My takings actually went up each year. <laughs> One of my customers, <laughs> he would have his little joke. Death sentences, he'd say. <laughs> That's what you're selling. <laughs> there ought to be a law against people like you, he'd say, when he came in to collect his 50 every morning. <laughs> he was a very comical character. <laughs> I was sorry to see him go. <laughs> I, uh, I said to Doris after the funeral, I said... Um, Supposing they did pass a law, I mean, what ought we to do? Don't worry, she said. Just you wait till the government tells us what to do. Of course they'll stop you selling fags if they're harmful, she said. But they'll give us compensation. You can trust the government. That was her favourite phrase. <laughs> God rest her soul. <laughs> she put her head in the gas oven when a bit of war loam fell to 53. Now, well, this other report came out, so I took the problem to our MP. Uh, our MP, a more straightforward man you couldn't hope to meet. Don't you worry, Armitage, he said. The government won't ban the sale of tobacco for one very good reason, he said. Because it would be interfering with the liberty of the subject. Now, there's 20 million smokers in the country, he said. Now, would it be fair to them? There is also the consideration that tobacco tax brings in £830 million a year, which is 14% of the annual revenue. And we just couldn't carry on without it. Well... <laughs> When he put it like that, I could see it was my patriotic duty to keep the kiosk open. I mean, if we closed down, you wouldn't have no hydrogen bombs and that. No. If you look at it this way, as these MPs do, impartially, 27,000 deaths a year from lung cancer, small price to pay for the liberty of the subject, plus a nuclear stockpile. 20,000 people. Well, it represents a population of quite a small town, like Newbury, say. Ha, 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 yes. I can see what you're thinking. You're thinking Newbury last year, Windsor this year, Abingdon, Wallingford, Lambourne, Streetly, Pangbourne next year. A few more years, we'll have got through the whole of Berkshire. But, but it's no use running away with the facts. Berkshire, pleasant as it is, has to be weighed against the long-term welfare of the country as a whole. So, I don't worry. If you take my tip, you won't worry either. If you feel like having a carcinogen... You go right ahead and have one. You've, you've got the law on your side, you've got the government behind you, and you're making your contribution to the defence of Britain and the cause of liberty for which so many of your fellow smokers have not hesitated to lay down their lives. What's wrong with the national anthem? Oh. Tell me that. What's wrong? Were you slight amendments and Bob's your uncle? Yeah. Our flag is red, me lads, and when we're dead, me lads, we'll all be stiff. And go home. Now, shut up, oh. Herbert. We've been through all that. Oh, sorry. Now, on my way back from fetching the last round, I met Miss Pyle of that sofa in the corridor and co-opted her. You never. I did. <laughs> I co-opted her as a non-voting member 
to give our deliberations a touch of musical finesse. <laughs> Delighted, I'm sure. Yeah, well, later, dear. Uh, her cholera... <laughs> her coloratura soprano is a credit to Transport House. Right, Miss Pyle? Lead the lads. The bull's flag... Shrouded off on the wood deep, and ere their limbs are crossed over the cold, their hearts blood dyed in every fold. The rays the scarlet sand and high beneath the shade will live or die. The cowards flinch and try to steer, keep the red flag flying here. Sir Alec, a great many people are desperately worried by the threat of a nuclear holocaust. But you have gone on record as saying <laughs> you will go on sleeping peacefully at night so long as the balance of terror is preserved. Can you tell us why? Yes, well, I sleep peacefully at all times for the simple reason that I don't worry about these things. If you look back into history, the time of your ancestors, as I frequently do, what do you find? There have always been wars, famines, and pestilences. Um, take the Black Death, a terrible scourge, killing off people like flies. Now, my ancestors didn't mope around the place worrying themselves sick about it. And what happened? None of them caught it. <laughs> so if you take my advice, you won't worry either. All you've got to do is to be terrified, and if everybody else is terrified too, you'll all get a good night's sleep. But there is a chance, isn't there, that somebody will eventually be so terrified that they'll drop the bomb. I mean, what makes you so confident, as you are always saying, that there will not be an atomic war? <laughs> oh, well, there hasn't been one yet, has there? <laughs> but, uh, Sir Alec, as a Christian, how do you find it possible to threaten your fellow human beings with untold megadeths? I said before, and I will say again that I see nothing incompatible between our religion, our bomb, and our foreign policy. After all, we used to use bows and arrows, but that didn't stop us becoming a Christian country. Now, there's no difference in principle between a megadeth and a bow and arrow death. And so long as they preserve peace, they are entirely with harmony with the teachings of all of Christianity. And nevertheless, many people do worry about the bomb being dropped by accident. Now, as I have said in public before, when the penalty is catastrophe, men do not lightly make mistakes. Uh, let me illustrate that from my own experience. If it is reported to me that suspicious objects are approaching our radar warning system, one of the first questions I ask is, are they wild geese? <laughs> now, I always get our people to look again, because geese do look rather like rockets on a radar screen. But I have found by experience that when in doubt, there is one infallible test. Rockets don't honk. <laughs> Finally, Sir Alec, you have argued neither America nor Russia will take any notice of you at the top table unless you have the bomb. But they don't now. Have you a word of comfort about that? No. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Alec. It's been most reassuring. Satisfy our old Wilson. Uh, let's bring to good old Harold Wilson. 
But he hasn't got more taste. Well, you me. can't play that on an upright Joanna in Hampstead Garden suburb without the all the ruddy trophy those neighbours banging dustbin lids. Am I right? Am I? Am I right? Am, am I right? Am I? Right, I, yeah, I am right. Am I right? Yeah. Well, all right. Then fill up for heaven's sake. We'll be here all night this night. Uh, I've been thinking. Oh no. <laughs> What's wrong with Rule Britannia? All right, I'll buy it. What's wrong? The people's flag is deep as red. It's shrouded off our heart a dead. It's shrouded off our heart a dead. And ere their limbs grow stiff and cold, their heart's blood died its every fold. Raise the standard, the scarlet standard high. Beneath this bloody, bloody shade we'll live 